So the question that we're exploring today is, if hell, if we know that hell is real, then what should we think or do or say about it? I remember when I was younger and I used to mock this idea. And I called it a tool of control and uh, from religious people who just want you to do what they say and scare you into becoming a follower of whatever they want you to do. Um, and I mocked this idea. But the crazy part about, about life is that just because we don't believe in something doesn't make it not real. And if this is a real place and we know that it is, what do we do and say and think about it? Of course. Why? Because, because I love them. Well, I wanted to show them. I just wanted to show them. So that they would know, huh? That yeah. Right? If you die, and you're and you have, and you live a bad life, then you'll maybe go to hell and see if it's alive or not. And in heaven, and heaven, see if God takes you away and you turn into and you go into heaven. You can see that heaven's real. So I heard a quote from a famous atheist where somebody, where he said, how much would you have to hate somebody to believe this truth, to believe that hell exists and not tell them how to not go there? And um, I totally resonated with that quote. Um, being an atheist. I, this is one of the reasons why it was so hard to believe Christians because it felt like they didn't believe. If they did believe this, why wouldn't they tell everybody all the time? And I just felt like not only was it, were they not telling me, but they were judging me and expecting me to go there, like as if the place wasn't real. And um, I, I think that for me, I appreciate it so much when somebody can look, look in my eyes and tell me the truth, even when it's hard, especially when it's hard. So that's why I appreciate Ryan and the way he talks sometimes, even though it can be like crazy sounding, that he will tell the truth. And um, yeah because he knows it's real. What is it in your life that is damning your soul? Okay. What, is, what does that look like? Because like, you know, we talked about, even in your whosoever videos, we talked about, oh, this is so powerful. I'm just realizing, putting it all together. Um, how... You talk about, for God has to love the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And everlasting life starts now. So is it, does it make sense that if you are damning your soul, you're doing it already. You already feel the death. So either you're dead or you're in everlasting life. You're dead leading to death eternally or you're li alive leading to life eternally. So what does that, um, what does that death eternally mean? You think? What does the Bible say about that? Or like, what do you, like when you're not walking with you, God. What do you know about eternal death? Well, eternal. See, we're all we were all created uh, to live forever. Like no one wants to die. There's nothing in us that wants to die. We're we're, we're eternal beings. Uh -huh. And when we don't have a walk, when we don't have a relationship with God. We are disconnected from eternity. This is why Jesus sent his son out of eternity. God so loved the world. He loved the world so much that he sent the son out of eternity to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And that whosoever, anyone that believe in him will have a life 
everlasting life. He will implant his spirit, and that's how you know he's real. And then that's how you know God's in you. You become God's child, mm -hmm. and that the communication is open now mm -hmm. to talk and talk back because that's we we serve an eternal God that is alive. And what happens is your name gets written in the book of life, it says, immediately. So when we take our last breath, and one day we all will, because life is like a vapor of smoke. We're here today. We're gone tomorrow. And from there, then what happens is we'll take our last breath, and then we instantly we are, we'll be caught up, and we'll be um, in the presence of God. Now, that's the good news. See, that's the gospel. That's the good news. Mm -hmm. Now, the bad news is when you don't have a relationship with God and you take your last breath, you're living here on earth, but then it's you die here on earth, but then the second death is you die and you go to you go to hell. But then what's happened is hell and it's dead and everything's going to be given up on the great day of judgment in Re Revelations 20, 11. And everyone's going to be judged for everything they've ever done. And then hell, everyone that was in hell, Satan, his demons, the Antichrist and everyone will be thrown into everlasting Gehenna, I believe it is. Is it Gehenna or it's, there's hell and then there's the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to talk about the lake of fire now. And you'll be thrown into the outer darkness forever and you'll have all your senses. Because mm -hmm. we know the story of um, Lazarus. Mm -hmm. You have all your senses, you have your memory, you're going to be able to taste, smell, touch, feel. And uh, I think the whole worst part is going to be your memory. It's just remembering all the times that you never gave your life to Christ. One of the things that I loved about rock music when I first started listening to it is that it really faced the reality of death. There was so much that was so real. And, and I experienced the tragic death of my three-year-old cousin, his murder, you know, um, in my family, the effect of that in my family when I was very young, when I was 10 years old. And everywhere I was looking for someone to speak about the reality of death after that. Um, I sort of thought about death all the time as a kid. Uh, I wanted to know why him and not me, and always just feeling, feeling like the world around me was not exploring this. And this was the release that I found in rock music. Wow, they're actually facing this reality. They're actually talking about death. Um, in this gothic culture that I found comforting in a way and um, because it felt real and and what I what was so amazing about Christ and when I realized the story of Christ it's such a I felt like it was so rock and roll like it's it's centered on the, the death of Jesus Christ and um, and I didn't hear a lot of Christian rock, which I thought was surprising because it's so countercultural, and that's what rock is about. It's so um, it's so realistic, like it's facing all of life's deepest questions and um, not running from them. And that's what I felt like rock did for me. Um, so, but the thing that's so that was so powerful like even in this interview with Ryan and him just talking openly about it is that we are forgiven of our sins through the blood of Jesus that's the truth of the gospel and we are only able to come to Christ to God we're only able to come to God the Father the creator of the cosmos through the blood of Christ through Christ himself the reality of the holiness of God is the most terrifying thing we will ever experience. And I know for certain that every human being will, because of experiential knowledge that I have from facing God on that day I planned to commit suicide, I know for a fact we will all face Him. The reason I was facing God in that moment was because He is my Creator. And life, the life He gives us all is a gift. And we will have to face the gift giver with what we did with the gift he gave us. We will have to face God. And when we experience the holiness of God, we will know how wrong we've been. Apart from him, there is no life, there's no love, there's only mercy that we're even still breathing. That's the reality 
of my experience with God and that I know people will have the same experience where they meet God when they come out of their bodies. And without Christ, I mean, I remember being so overwhelmed by why He would love me. Why can I even continue to breathe in the presence of such holiness? Why? I remember being so overwhelmed with that question. And I found the answer in the scriptures and in my relationship with Jesus. It's because of the blood of Jesus. There is something that, that, that your penalty of sin was paid by the blood of Jesus. That's the only way to be forgiven. Apart from that, we are, we are, it is terrifying to face God. And we won't survive. <laughs> we can't. And that's the reality of it. So for me, I remember after I experienced this love of God so strongly and, and it was filled with a love for others, I remember looking around at school one day and realizing how many people in my school didn't know Christ and, and, and didn't know that they needed His blood to cover them before they faced God. And who knows when they were going to die? You never know from one day to the next. That was so real to me from the time my, my cousin's death when he was three. And so I, I remember feeling this panic and this fear and this overwhelming sense of like, oh God, they don't know you. And I was crushed because He had put love in me for them. And I couldn't understand, why would you make me love somebody so much? And then also help, let me know that they don't know you and that they can die without you. And, and, and then the reality of hell, that there's a real place that our spirits will go to when we leave this body, either, either with God or apart from Him forever, where there's only torment. And I thought, that can't be right. Something's wrong with that, that they just can't be right. So I remember going through the scriptures and going, and trying to make a case to disprove that hell was real. <laughs> and I came up with lots of verses to help me think, oh, maybe it's not real. That would give me peace. That would bless me. <laughs> that maybe God will just figure it out and sort it out somehow and that won't be the reality that people face. And then the same time, shortly after that, I wrote about this in The Reason, my first book. Shortly after that, I made this case against hell being real. I heard a testimony from a guy named Bill Weiss who, who had an experience where God took him to hell and showed him. And at first I didn't believe him at all. But then, and then, the reality of it hit me like an arrow in my heart and the Holy Spirit convicted my heart and showed me that it was real. And then when I opened up my Bible, I saw that it was plain as day. You can see it from the front cover to the back cover that, that there is no, that we are eternal beings. That when we go to the other side, we will have even more of our senses than we do here. And we will experience either eternal heaven or eternal hell, eternal, you know, no more sorrow, death, crying, or pain, or we will exist in that. And I, I remember when that hit me, I could not function. I, I, I didn't leave the house for three days crying about it. Because if it's real, it, what can we do? What can we say? There's people there already. How are we supposed to deal with that? reality and and you know the response of weeping for three days is nothing compared to eternity but I I remember when it lifted that was the grace of God which I don't understand even that but the fact that it lifted off of my heart so that I could go out of the house and start eating again and start you know just to me it was like God was saying, there's work to do. There's stuff to do. And it actually motivated me to continue in Flyleaf because I was on a, at a crossroads about whether or not I should continue with Flyleaf. And it was before we, it was like either right after we got signed or right before we got signed because there was stuff happening with my family and I wanted to leave Flyleaf and go and sort the things out with 
my little brother and my sisters at home with my mom. And um, when I came out of this mourning over the reality of hell, I couldn't shake the fact that there were so many kids out there that had never even known or believed that God is real because of pain in their lives, because of things from their parents or their just things that have been done to them or against them or spoken to them. And I thought, I have to write songs that will, that will bring God's presence so that they can experience Him. I have to do this. And I knew it was about this. This was the motivation. And even now, as I'm, as I'm giving this interview, as I'm speaking this to you right now, there is a crossroads for me about whether or not to continue to make videos and to continue to bring God's scriptures to people. And this actually coming back to the subject and the confirmation that to remember that this is a reality, that we have a short amount of time to tell people the truth and to tell them that that hell was never intended for people. Jesus said it was created for the devil and his angels. And he's always trying to seduce us into following him to that place. But no one has to go there, and that's why Jesus came. So no one would have to go there, no one. All would be able to be rescued from that place, even though we have chosen things that are from hell, even though we have followed the enemy towards hell, that the scripture says in Jude that we would snatch them from the flames, that we can do that. Um, and that's what we do. And that's why, that's why we still do what we do. That's why I still write songs. That's why I still do what I do. And so the motivation to know that God is good and He loves people more than I ever could and His compassion is greater than mine, I can't. And, and if he's calling me into this really important business to tell people the truth about him, I have to say yes. And I'm glad I get to talk to you today and to come back to the present moment, this present moment of hope that we have to choose Christ and to tell others is, um, is something to hang on to and to continue to wake up for. And it's really important. How, if this exists, how did Jesus defeat hell? Like, isn't, don't we say Jesus defeated hell? On the cross. He defeated him on the cross. He shamed all the principalities, Satan and all his demons. If you, if you think about what that probably looked like that day when he was hanging on the cross, Satan and all his demons in the supernatural realm were just probably, I mean, it was the, the biggest event of show. mankind. Imagine just what that looked he like there. He made a show of them openly. He did. It was a show. He did it. He died. On the cross, he took all the sins of the whole entire world from beginning time to the end upon himself. And with the blood that was shed on the cross, we are washed white as snow. As the simple thing, childlike faith, just believing that he died on the cross and he raised from the dead. So what does that make you feel like about sin, personally? What, that, what do I think about sin? Is that um, what is what does the cross make you feel like about sin personally? What does that make you feel like or think about sin for yourself? Like if in the attempt if it's offered to you or what does it make you? Oh well, basically what I well, what I see is that Jesus Jesus paid it all. What he did on the cross that day for us was the the, the biggest act of love for mankind, mm -hmm. and I just don't want to spit in his face. And and sin, when you're involved with it, it's like a it's like a sh it's like a it's like cotton candy, you know. Like Satan, like puts it out. Like I like the red cotton candy, the pink one, my favorite. And you look at it, and what sin, what what Satan does with sin is he he gives he shows you it, and you're like, this looks really good, this cotton candy. And then what happens is, you take a huge bite out of it, you put it in your mouth, and then you think that big bite's gonna fulfill you. But as cotton candy does, when you put it in your mouth, it disintegrates into little pebbles instantly. It's like empty. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing with sin is it never pans out. It always seems like it's going to be more exciting than it is, but you're always left empty. And if you eat that whole cotton candy thing, you're going to feel sick at the end and you're going to pass the rest of it. So is that why you tell people about Jesus? I let them. I, and that's because why I tell you, people. Because you love them and you want them not to have that emptiness. Or I tell them because I've seen what God's done in my life 
It's real. It's not religion. And I'm seeing people that were now that were depressed that are no longer depressed. People that were suicidal no longer suicidal. People that were involved in the the homosexual lifestyle are no longer. No, I I'm aware of hell. I don't really. I was driving down a highway one day and I saw a sign that said Jesus or hell. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's not a way to reach anybody. And um, I. You know, I'd rather tell them about the good news. I, I don't dwell on hell too much. Not that I don't believe in it. You know, I don't, not that I don't believe in hell. I, I, just, I just see grace. I just see heaven. And I think uh, that's where my heart's at. And so, yeah. I, I wouldn't want anybody preaching to me, you know, try to get me saved by, you know, talking about hell. That's just, you know, I yeah. think the wrong way to go about it. To start a relationship like that, say, you know, you want somebody to, you want to be in a relationship with somebody and you're not going to like, if you don't follow me, I'm going to throw you in jail. Instead, you want to say, I yeah. love you, follow me. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And then it turns out if you don't, you're going to end up in jail. Yeah. The power of the gospel will overturn eternal destiny from going into a dark place to going into a place of eternal light. The power of the gospel is new life. It's it's, it's love itself. It is, it's the greatest love story ever told. And I believe this is why God created the world for us to live in, because of love, so that he could express his love for us and we could love him in return. So Lord, I thank you that we don't have to perform empty rituals of dead religion. Um, you are alive and you are awesome and you are holy. And I don't even pretend to even come close to understanding all the things that I long to understand about you and about eternity and about your ways. But I do know that you are love itself, that you are good and holy. I do know those things. I know that you have more compassion than I ever could and you're the reason why I love it all. So I just pray, God, that you would, you would just, I would just give you my trust. I would just give you my heart. I give you right now, I give you my mind and my body so that you would take my life and you would preach the gospel through me, Lord. And I thank you for the chance you've given us to share your love and your truth with the world that will set people free and snatch them from the flames. I thank you that you are the righteous God that is beyond comprehension and I release all this grief to you and ask you to fill me with your peace and your presence so I can live and love like you do and reflect your love back to the world around me. Amen. Thank you.